Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for being here today. I'm Jackie, the curator of the Sheldon Jackson Museum, and I'm just going to make a few announcements here before I turn it over to Lily. We'll spotlight her and I will have her share her screen um, and she will do her magic for you. So we're very fortunate to have Lily Hope here. Uh, before I introduce her, I just wanted to share with you a few things. Uh, first of all, this is the very last of the Friends of Sheldon Jacks Museum Winter Share Your Research, Share Your Culture series. So the Friends of Sheldon Jacks Museum have sponsored and paid for this wonderful series. We've had a number of events, a few more than a half dozen, I think, so far. And they have uh, kindly paid for all of the speakers to receive an honorarium. And uh, I hope that we can repeat this series next winter. If you're interested in supporting the Friends of Sheldon Jackson Museum and their efforts to carry out the mission, which includes hosting wonderful artists like Lily to speak and putting on the winter series, uh, underwriting the residency program and supporting that financially, et cetera, then I would encourage you to support the Friends in their um, endeavor to match the Texans. They have a fundraiser going by that same name. And if you like, you're welcome to go to their website so that you can actually um, make a donation. I'm going to just um, go ahead and put it inside of the chat really quickly so that you have access to that nice and easily. Of course, if you go to the friendsofsjm.com website, you can access their general website. You'll see a pop-up about matching the Texans. And if you want to go straight into the Match the Texans website, then you can um, add a few more notes. You'd go to https colon slash slash friendsofsjm.com slash match. So please um, help the friends also look for their April 2nd fundraiser. That's the silent auction event happening next Saturday at the Unitarian Church here in Sitka. All of the sale of the wonderful silent auction items, which includes an array of um, things such as um, hardcover bound books about art, including some Alaska Native art related texts um, bags, jewelry, there's a lovely pair of dance fans and different things that some artists have donated. All of those things will be sold and the proceeds 100% will be counted towards this Match the Texans program. So essentially, if you buy something for $50, your $50 purchase will get you whatever you bought. And it will provide the friends with $100 because the Texans are kindly doubling that um, gift of yours in exchange for your um, take home silent auction item. So thanks to the Texans for that. Thanks to the friends for that good work. And now um, on to Lily. So Lily Hope is an indigenous artist, weaver, teacher, and she's also a mother, a single mother of five children. And she recently opened up her very own uh, street level storefront in Juneau, which I cannot wait to hear more about. So very exciting. Um, coming to us soon. She assisted her mother in weaving preparations throughout childhood, um, not understanding at the time that she was getting ready to become a lifelong weaver herself. And she began weaving Raven's Tail textiles in 1995 and Chilcat weaving in 2010. When Lily was halfway done with her first Chilcat robe, her mother, Clarissa Rizal, died, leaving her holding the weft strands and all the traditional knowledge learned from master Chilcat weaver, Jenny Huno. Um, you've probably seen images or yourself, the small robe, the child's robe that hangs in the museum gallery made by Jenny. So we have a strong connection to her. Lily weaves daily and enthusiastically she teaches both Raven's Tale and Chilcat weaving. She's dedicated to upholding the oral and written teachings from Jenny and Clarissa by demonstrating weaving 
lecturing on the spiritual commitments of a weaver's life and teaching the next honorable weavers. She prefers weaving her robes in public and is energized by sharing her knowledge, which is what this entire presentation is about. It's a call to weavers. So without further ado, I invite you to mute yourself if you have not already, and I will mute myself and I will make Lily the co-host and spotlight her for everyone. And she can begin. Bear with me for one moment. Thank you, Jackie, for hosting me for um, thanks to the friends of the Sheldon Jackson Museum. Oh, fix the hair. Uh, um, <clears throat> welcome back to some of you who got to share with me this morning. For, sorry for the snafu. I was doing a presentation in the UK, but in Alaska. So that was really fun this morning. Um, if, if you're back to hang out with me, don't be surprised if you see similar images. My words may change, but similar imagery. And uh, you are joining me in Juneau, Alaska in this virtual space. Um, this is my like 15th day in the um, studio, Wushkin Dainda'at, Lily Hope Weaver Studio here in Juneau, Alaska. Um, we are street level. We have windows that face Seward Street in downtown Juneau. And if you make it to 99801, um, I hope you come by and hang out with us. We have a table set up with cedar bark and um, and mountain goat of the fluffy, fluffy variety. And it is in varying stages of processing. So when you come over to hang out with us, you're invited to pull all of the fun things out of the mountain goat because this used to be a community activity. I'll talk more about that in a little bit, but just wanted to give you a sense of where I am. And I'm technically on the homelands of the Clinkett indigenous peoples. Uh, I am also Raven Duck Tan from the Clinkett lineage. Didn't even say Wushkin Dane Da'at Yochet Dewasak, Yech Nachatsati Duck Tan Ayachet. My Clinkett name is Wushkin Dane Da'at. I was encouraged by my sister Ursula Hudson, who is Kadusne.com. Um, that's her Clinkett name. She said, What's going on, Lily? I think you should probably rebrand and be Wushkin Dane Da'at. So at some point, maybe I will drop Lily or have that be my second name. But for now, I'm still Lily Hope. Um, but my all my signage and everything, and if you've ever gotten a pair of earrings from me, those will now read Wushkin Dane Da'at. So exciting, lots of big changes. Um, I'm, I want to share with you, our, our talk today is all about this call for assistance. So I'm gonna start by going into a little slideshow. I'm gonna start after I start, right? Should we pre-board before we board? <laughs> um, so here's a little bit of background for those who are kind of new-ish to this. Let's see if I can do this by slideshow. Big screen, yay. Wish can Dana at, yay. Um, it's true, I'm a weaver, artist, teacher. It doesn't say mother on here because, um, Darn it, we're not paid to be mothers yet. I, oh, darn, but um, that's, that's me, that's where I'm at. And it is because of my mother and teacher Clarissa Rizal that I am here. I uh, thought I was gonna be an actor, but maybe I'm just a performing artist and this is how I perform, that's great. And uh, this is a robe that I wove for Portland Art Museum. Our Chilkat blankets have been recording history for hundreds of years. They uh, capture our dreams, our stories, our clan histories, our lineages. This is the lineage robe. It is a version of a robe that my mother wove called Jenny Weaves an Apprentice. Uh, one of the first few that she wove, actually not the first few, it was 10 years into her career that she wove this one. But I wove the little tiny C-shaped blue thing with double yellows in it um, on the robe that she started in 2010 of this version. And um, then it became the first robe that I wove. So funny that that goes full circle and like first chill cat weaving I worked on also the first one that I finished, weirdly different, but similar that the designs are slightly different. Um, that is a traditional method in teaching that you can find these painted pattern boards throughout time. And you might find three, four, five, seven robes woven off of the same pattern board, but you'll see little tiny elements have changed or maybe the colors from 
the finished blankets have been moved around a bit. So in her original robe, the top left and right corners had little profile chilcat faces in them. And I wasn't brave enough to weave those in my first blanket. I thought that two big, big noses in the center would be hard enough, which they were. Um, but uh, that's, that's where I started. And I was again, halfway through this when my mother passed. So here I am holding these weaver strands and uh, not sure how to go forward but I had to go forward, right? We have to move on. So carrying that grief into the work and um, beyond. And this is where my mother is ever present is in the, in the work behind me. But, you know, whenever I'm at the loom, she's here. Myself and Ricky Tagaban finished this robe together in 2020. Uh, because of the pandemic, we did a masked um, first dance event. My eldest child danced it fully masked in the Shuka hit at the Alaska Heritage Institute. That's where this photograph on the left is. You can see a little hint of that glass Preston Singletary house screen um, and Ricky's hands on the left, mine on the right. And if you can zoom, I don't know if you can see it. Oh, you can't see it in this. Um, his signature is on the left side of the weaving and mine is on the right. So we talk about signatures, um, you know, being able to record who made the blanket. This one is distinct because there's two different different signatures on it. So that's fun. Um, I want to get to this call for you because we have been working on blankets one or two weavers at a time um, for since since the early 80s, mid 80s, we had one or maybe two spinners who are spinning the warp for all of the people who are making ceremonial regalia and then smaller classes. Uh, Kay Parker was doing most of the Raven's Tale warps spinning and then Elena Mountford who is Cheryl Samuel you know her Cheryl Samuel's daughter Elena was the like solo or like one of three other Chilcat spinners who were spinning with yellow cedar in the in the warp itself and in the last year Elena has stopped spinning so we kind of scrambled last fall to figure out how are we supposed to start new projects together um, if we don't have a spinner. <laughs> so out of that, we realized there are a couple other spinners in the world, one in Washington state, so maybe one of you is here. Um, but then um, I started teaching online and realized that I can't physically, I single person cannot physically spin enough warp for all of these students. So we wanted to weave these 32 inch blankets. So we all had to start spinning ourselves, which is really amazing because of the, I think there's 25 of us that started spinning. And of those 25, I think there are now four or maybe five, which is huge thinking there's been one or two people this whole time that are pretty good spinners and are willing to continue to spin, that they can split some of their time spinning and some of their time weaving because um, they're, not managing five kids and weaving blankets and and teaching and and, and. so it's great we need, we need you we love you you spinners we love you um so that's an issue that's already been like shifted and we're we're hopeful that those spinners keep spinning or that we can continue to share how to spin and keep you know finding those people who love spinning work i i was um as you watched me i was preparing this so I've got a pile of single ply roving that I've been splitting down so that we can start spinning again. And I've also got some preparations over here because I, I wanna make it um, evident that every moment that a weaver is not prepping her materials, um, she's losing precious moments, right? So if I'm not you know, splitting cedar bark into tiny pieces or cutting my roving, you know, splitting my, pulling my roving down, um, idle hands, right? I always thought that my mother was nuts, uh, always having something in her hands. We'd go to dinner parties and she'd have some of this, or she'd be splitting bark into teeny tiny pieces or making slip knots. She was like, oh, nobody bothers me if I'm making split slip knots. It's just like doing knitting or crochet. They're not gonna, you know, nobody cares what I'm doing. And at least her hands were moving. And she said, just wait. When you are in the midst of a, a weaving and you have only four hours to sit at your loom, you're going to want to make slip knots while you're watching a kid's movie with your children or, you know, sitting waiting for the dentist to pick you up or whatever. So that's a thing. 
that we need to get more people thinking this way, that um, you know, every spare moment we could be doing some handiwork and thinking about even just a hundred years ago, how much we didn't work. And I shouldn't say we didn't work, how much we worked in community We'd, we'd go out and harvest the things that we needed for our families, for our communities. Um, hunters and fishermen would go out together and gather enough for their families and communities. It was not a solo one person gig, right? Now it's like, oh, I'm going to be the person washing the dishes and I'm going to do all the laundry and I'm going to make all the money and I'm going to, I'm going to make sure the kids get to the dentist and I'm going to do this. And I'm, like all the things that we are doing as a single household, it, even if there are two adults in the household, it's too much. We don't have our aunties and our grandmas and our sisters and our nieces that are here with us to say, hey, I can... I can entertain these kids while you're making dinner or you need work doing this. Let's sit around and tell each other silly stories and lament at how much our feet hurt from, you know, whatever else we've been doing that we're not doing that together and we're so isolated. And now this pandemic has made it worse, right? That we're even more isolated and we're, I mean, mental health is on the right. I mean, mental health crisis is, that's, that's where we are, right? That we've been isolated so long, we're expected to do all of these things ourselves, our community is fragmented, and yet here we are needing to do all of this prep work for these monumental works. So earlier today with um, the other presentation I did, um, I was sharing out that a single chill cat dancing blanket is 2000 plus hours in the making. If we return to using our mountain goat and source our cedar bark and continue to prepare materials like this, we're almost doubling our work hours, right? We're gonna spend hundreds, if not thousands of hours, you know, sorting out all of the tiny little sticks in here, um, pulling out all of the guard hairs out of our mountain goat, processing it, carding it, combing it out so that it's not just a pile of fluff, but turns into this beautiful roving. So this is my call. My call is let's come back together as a community. That's why I opened my studio. Because one, I love weaving in public. I, I thrive on the connection of human peoples. Um, really wanted to be an actor. It's fine, it's fine. Um, <laughs> It's, it's the working together that makes the work light, that makes our hearts light, that makes us, I don't know. Um, many artists like to work in, in, in their quiet spaces and I'm not one of them. And uh, I, I don't know that that's how we did this, right? Because we had our uncles and brothers and fathers painting our pattern boards. We had all of us going out and collecting little bundles of of wool off of the bushes. Every time we went somewhere, even if it was cut up in the moss, we'd be pulling this off the bushes and bringing it down to the weavers. And it wasn't the weavers alone who were processing this, right? It was all of us sitting together, being together in this community space. So that's my call to you, is to come by the studio, to find times to help process work, to, um, send us scraps of cedar bark. Um, what else, what, what else? We, you can't, I mean, why do I say send us scraps of cedar bark? I'm saying that because the cedar stands that are close to where I am in Juneau, um, the underbrush is not growing thanks to climate change. And we are, we are not able to go harvest the bark because the trees are freezing to death. So that's our, that's our issue here is that now we need to go south into Prince of Wales or Ketchikan and go harvest bark down there. Uh, we, have to, we have to partner and gather together and go out to the timber harvesting company that's out there and put on our hard hats and go up before they fell the trees or just after they bring down the trees and pull off large volumes of cedar bark not just for us, but for the cedar weavers, again, coming back together as a community, as a network, as a team, as um, 
this unified group of people who are concerned about the future of this work. And what happens if we don't get access to yellow cedar? Many of us have already kind of moved into using red cedar because it's more accessible or we can get it even all the way down into Washington. Um, it's a little more like tough on our hands, right? As you start spinning it, you're gonna have like, a, you're gonna build calluses more quickly. But yeah, it's, um, it's goat hair, it's cedar bark and Here's the other part, is that this, this movement toward going back to mountain goat and yellow cedar, we've always been using the yellow cedar, but in merino wools, when we go back to this um, mountain goat use, there is an element of um, bringing back that ancestral knowledge, bringing back that feeling of the animal wanting to be danced, that I don't know if you've ever felt a merino chilcat blanket and a fully mountain goat chilcat blanket, but they are so different that when you place this, this Terry Rafkar DNA robe, fully made of mountain goat, even the little weaver strands are all mountain goat, you drape this over your shoulders, there is a being that wants to be danced, it wants to move. Um, it's calling us to come back to the mountain goat bring that animal back to life with us, put on that second skin and feel the ceremony that's in our backyard. So if you have the impetus to pull, pull wool with us, to send us bark, um, to cook bark, you can totally look up all these videos on YouTube. Sea Alaska Heritage Institute did a whole series. I, I should say, I partnered with Sea Alaska Heritage Institute and the Siri Foundation, Journey to What Matters. We put together a series of videos that you can watch how to process um, wool and cedar bark, um, how to dye the three colors in our Chilcat dancing blankets. And you can be part of our preparation with us. Because as we get better and better at doing this and we build more spinners, right? We're also building this community of weavers because we have more than 30 weavers who are starting little 30 inch, 32 inch Chilcat dancing blankets. And of course, most of us had to spin our own warp for this project. Um, and once we're done at the end of this year or early next 2023, uh, there's gonna be more than 20 people who could weave a chill cat ceremonial blanket. That's pretty cool. Because at any point in the last 100, 150 years, there's less than a dozen. And I can only count seven who will weave for a museum or an art collector or someone outside of the community. That's pretty amazing. We're gonna, gonna double, triple those numbers maybe. But that also means we need your help. We need your help to come and process mountain goat. We need your help to come and find the trees with us and pull off the cedar bark and don't put your cedar bark in plastic if it's still wet, fresh off the tree. Don't let it mold. Um, reach out to us, come, come hang out with us and process materials. Um, I didn't even go any further with our slide. Do you wanna see the rest of our slides? <laughs> Look, in 2020, I put this together um, the Chilcat protector masks. Uh, Katie Bun Marcuse saw this online and she said, whatever you do, you have to let me have this first mask. And thanks to Katie Bun Marcuse, uh, I have woven over 20 of these masks since April of 2020 and gone from having my work in three collections to like 17, 13, something, something off the charts. But also there's almost 45 people who have woven one of these masks. So I taught three or four different workshops in the past couple of years. So these masks have gone far and wide, like outside of Alaska. Um, in all the different colors, it's been really amazing. Um, because what we're saying here is that our community is where we originate. Right, that's, that's our whole worldview is not about the single individual. It's about what is good for our community, right? That's why we're wearing masks. That's why some of us are choosing vaccines. That's, 
you know, the, the masking is the protection of our most vulnerable, right? So I don't know, this, this one on the left and my aunt, aunt Diana is wearing it. That's the one that went to the Burke. This one in the middle with the All Our Ancestors Ravenstill pattern woven by my eldest child and uh, Jeffrey Gibson owns this mask. And then the one on the right here um, was, um, this one lives with my brother of all people. He was, he was a big encourager of me continuing to weave them. And so for his birthday in 2021, I sent him a mask and he just about fell over. So <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's been amazing to share these out to see the variation in color and pattern of all the artists that have come to this work. Um, one of my students last year um, said, oh, I've kind of wanted to be a weaver. And she signed up to do this class. And I didn't know it. And she didn't tell me she was almost done with this mask. She had never woven a stitch of either Chilkat or Raven's Tail ever. And what's happening in here is these noses are the hardest thing. They are the hardest thing, hands down, to weave in a chill cat anything. And any textile in the Northwest Coast, noses are really hard. And she did it. And now she's like, well, I guess I don't have to weave anything. I'll just weave a blanket now. Is that what I need to do? So yes, we're talking about you, Ray. <laughs> so um, all the good things. Uh, I am also really grateful to be able to work on repairing and restoring other blankets. I've worked on a few now. I still have one rolled up that needs repair. So um, don't ask me to repair one yet until that one's ready. Um, but yeah, I, I can't believe that this is my life. I guess I should say that. And I, I do say that a bit that um, I work with these masterful pieces and uh, that, that the gratitude is overwhelming. I mean, I'm just floored. This is the robe that I'm working on behind me. I can show it to you in just a minute. Um, my sister Ursula Hudson Kadusne digitized it for me. I, I will not show you the little kid sketch that I sent her that she turned into this amazingness. Um, what isn't in this particular image is in the ovoid of the hand on the right side of this picture is that's actually going to be a very pale yellow, a wolf moss yellow. Here it is better. You can see the yellow in the left and right hands. Um, so yeah, do you have, oh, and I should say that this is what I do. I've been teaching Chilkat weaving since 2010 and really online pretty strongly since July, 2020. Um, and, uh, the, this is my happy place is teaching and, um, leading others through this work because we're full of doubts. Like, we we human beings are full of self doubt, but then you layer on the chill cat technique, and all of our little neuroses and little idiosyncrasies come out. And we're like, I can't actually do that. No, I can't do that. No, I don't think it's right. And then we take it out, and then we're like, it was right. Didn't have to take it out. So we celebrate our challenges and successes every single Sunday together uh, on Zoom. And students from here to Whitehorse, all the way into Alberta, and. Um, used to be Nebraska, but she moved to Alaska, and then all the way out to Maine. Um, don't have any over the oceans yet. Time, time changes are pretty tricky. They'd be weaving in the middle of the night with us, but someday, someday. Um, what else? I think that's it. Do you want to come over and see this weaving with me? Oh, I see that there's someone in the chat. Oh, the address for my studio. Thanks for asking. Before I move over here, um, the Friends of SJ Museum just asked, the address for my new studio is 221 Seward Street. Um, looking at maybe being open on Friday, Saturday, Sundays. Um, might I might convince my studio manager to let me be open just like 10 to 2, five days a week. We'll see. Um, we kind of have to gauge what the interest is from the tourists that are coming in. And um, it's really hard because our windows are right here and people can walk by and can be like, what's up, Joe? Hey, Jim, come over, oh, Steve, uh, um, Jane. Uh, so that's been tricky, but yes, 221 Seward Street, we are the old art such photography space. And uh, yeah, happy to have you come hang out with us as long as your hands are moving. <laughs> So come on over and see what I'm working on and do, 
do 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 ask me the things do you have questions for me yet let's see let's get you right up in here so you can see what i'm working on so i didn't make that already clear we need your help and um we need your help regardless of where you were born and what your day job is. Um, we'd appreciate your hands and your hearts in the work working with us. Yep. All right, ask me all the things. Questions? So um, we'll open it up for Q&A for, for the general audience uh, in just a moment. Um, this is Jack, Jackie, Lily, thank you so much for being here and for talking to us. Um, I guess I have a couple questions I'm wondering what is the best way specifically for people on this call who are interested in assisting to help <coughs> logistics wise? And also um, it sounds like it's very wide open to natives and non-natives. Could you give a little bit of guidance for non-native users of the materials? Sure. Um, well, I would say before working with the materials come and hang out with us if you can or at least watch the youtube videos that are online um, with sea alaska heritage institute on how to um, cook the cedar bark if you get your hands on some or how to process the wool uh, yeah or reach out to me um, lilyhopeweaver at gmail.com or find me on instagram at lilyhopeweaver um, and how, how would you go about doing it? I guess those are really good choices. It's hard if you're not in the zip code, right? If you're not actually able to access a person in real life, right? Um, and when you're preparing materials, I guess it's similar to when you come to the work here that you want to come to it with a clean mind, you know, don't come into it with all the rage and and uh, negativity of the day if you got cut off in traffic or so and so called and said that you know your your car's not going to be ready for another six hours so you don't actually get to go out and watch your kid do that thing you know all the things um be conscious about the energy that you're putting into it because as we put energy into this work um we tend to feel it even on the subtlest level right that it's that like water for chocolate thing right that um, when she's having an emotional day and then she feeds everyone, everyone starts crying at the table. So we don't wanna put that kind of energy into a ceremonial object, even from the very start. So there's, there's other things that you could be doing and laying on the floor and taking long deep breaths. That's a good idea. And then come to the work. Thanks for asking, Jackie. Anyone else? Oh, question. Oh. If anyone has a question, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, there are a number of people on the call and we'd love to hear from you. Uh, if anyone has any, any questions about what Lily's actually weaving or um, about her new studio or about the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute videos that are up. Um, and if no one else has any other question, I have another question for you, Lily, but I'm gonna open it up first to the floor. Okay. Well, looks like, looks like none yet. So I'm just curious, you've talked a little bit about the difference between weaving with yellow cedar bark versus red cedar bark. Um, I'm wondering, and also you mentioned differences between working with goat hair compared to merino wool. I'm wondering if you could speak at all about the differences um, in working with natural dyes versus commercially available dyes, if you have any thoughts on that. And also if you've experimented at all with the dye, um, I'm not quite sure what the dye working group is called, if it has an official title, but the group that Ellen Carley, the conservator at the Alaska State Museum in Juneau has been working a lot with local weavers um, throughout Southeast. Thank you. Yeah, um, great, thanks Jackie. Um, uh, this robe is actually incorporating both the natural dyes. So this is hemlock bark, and this is the copper ammonia recipe from Ethnographic Records. 
um, where we soak little pipes of copper in a gallon of ammonia. It turns into this brilliant bright blue cobalt liquid. And then we pour it over the yarns and it does not make this color. It makes a slate gray Juno afternoon kind of color. And um, I, I don't wanna weave with it. But then the magic is actually in um, taking a bottle of apple cider vinegar, making sure that it's one with the mother inside um, with those little, like the little scoby, if it was a kombucha, right? All those little threads, that good stuff. Um, if you pour that good apple cider vinegar over the slate gray yarns, it pops into this in just moments. Like in less than a minute, you get this beautiful seafoam green. And that's the recipe from hundreds of years. I don't know how old the writing is. We should find out how old that original writing is. But that's it that gets this color. And I did intentionally dye this hemlock a lot lighter. I didn't cook it for the whole seven hours um, because I wanted the contrast between the acid dyed black and this brown. Because you can tell, can you tell these are eyebrows? Right, those are going to be eyebrows. And then there's actually an eyeball going in right here. There's like a pupil that's going to happen right in here and another one over on the side. So um, this is the yellow that my mother um, found from, my mother brought five different yellows to Jenny Clanot after their six week apprenticeship. And my mother said, which yellow should I be using? And Jenny chose this one. So we call it Jenny's yellow. And my mother said, well, why this one? Why not this like pale, pale yellow like this? Why this one? And Jenny said, 500 years, this will still be yellow. 500 years, this one might be white. Right? So we use this bright, bright yellow. And so I brought that into this weaving in homage to Clarissa and Jenny, but also in this, in this conversation, a juxtaposition of this particular design that we have the black primary form line here dyed with acid dyes with the contemporary weavers of today and the, the bold yellow border. And then the background design in here, let's see if we can do it. As you saw in the transparency earlier in there, you can see that the other colors are coming through here, right? This is the seafoam green, this is the hemlock. Um, there is a spirit being with her face pressed against the veil of this chill cat blanket. And combined in there, collaged into it, is this primary form line of the diving whale pattern. And if a chill cat weaver lives long enough um, and weaves long enough, she will likely weave a diving whale. The diving whale pattern is not owned by any one single clan. Um, you're not stepping on any cultural toes to weave the diving whale. Um, you know, you're not going to have your, your hand slapped and said, you know, you wove that without permission. Um, so it's, I, I think about it as the design that's kind of in the public domain, like twinkle, twinkle, little stars. So find a diving whale and weave one if you so desire. But this whole pattern, right? So you've got the diving whale and the black acid, um, acid dyed black form line happening. And then this being pushing her her face against the veil with a hand on either side. So there's hands happening here. Don't know if you can see that part, right? There's that hand. But again, all of these black elements that would have been the, the twin elements that are in traditional distributive chill cat blankets. So it's a merging of this old knowledge and new knowledge and then flipping it so that we have the old pattern on the ancestor coming through this piece and the acid dyes and you know the black and yellow of present day weavers. So right, we're kind of like merging them all through each other. Pretty sweet. Um, I am part of the Chill Cat Dye Working Group. Uh, we will be presenting, um, I've been working with them for a couple of years now with Ellen Carley at the Alaska State Museum. And uh, we're flying to Los Angeles sometime in middle of May to be part of, I want to say there's a huge conservation presentation happening in Los Angeles. So that's happening. And then they will be coming up for a celebration here in Juneau. We're going to have a little like short and sweet weavers gathering on the morning of the 8th of June. So if you're watching this a year from now, you missed it. <laughs> but um, yeah, so lots of things coming. We've done, we've my work with the Chilcat Dye Working Group was to assist in sending down raw liquids or you know little snippets of stuff that we knew what the dye was made of. 
right? So we were taking this and going, okay, we know this has copper and ammonia and vinegar. We're going to send that down. So we were helping build the little database with all the different colors. We sent like 17, 18, 20 different yellows to them. Um, Patty Fiorella has been really amazing on um, dyeing all the different kinds of browns because there are so many different brown and black variations. She went to town for like two summers and sent them so many different colors. Um, so they took that database and now the chemists at Portland State University in partnership with Alaska State Museum can take the tiniest snip, like, like a tiny, teeny, teeny, tiny clip off of an old robe, send it down to them. They send it through their little spinny, like chemistry machine. Oh my gosh, it has such a fancy name too. Um, and then it spikes, right? The little readout actually spikes and tells you or tells them they can read that to mean, oh, this is made of this particular plant. Oh, this is made of wolf moss. Oh, this isn't actually hemlock bark. Um, I'm not at liberty to share any of the actual findings um, that, that has been um, protected and with good reason that they've spent so long doing all this research. So we'll get a little, um, a nice taste of it in June this summer when they come up to share. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Um, thanks to the chat. Thanks, um, Leela, for watching from BC. Yay, I'm glad you're hopefully. Yeah, who is over there in British Columbia? Um, Willie White. Um, Megan O'Brien, not sure where you are. I do have a couple weavers in British Columbia. Oh, I should I should say you can also find me on Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Lily Hope Weaver. And um, check out what um, I, there are some membership levels that you can just come and hang out on Sundays and weave with us, bring a project that you've been working on or hang out and weave and hang out with us. Bring your beadwork if you want. Yeah, we've got a couple fiber artists that um, spin with us every Sunday and they're not working on the blanket with us, but it's been a lot of fun to share knowledge with them and figure out Z twist and S twist and all sorts of, all sorts of things. <laughs> yeah, it's been great. Wonderful, Lily. I saw recently, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were awarded a residency at the Burke Museum in Seattle. Is that correct? This is all happening. Yes, this is correct. So if we go backwards, I just came back from um, Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. Uh, we did 22 days in Santa Fe, right at the peak of numbers <laughs> in Santa Fe. It was terrible. Um, the, the, um, so just did a, a residency there. Uh, I am gonna go to the Burke with my sister, Kadusne. Uh, we'll be there for four days, I think, two days of research and two days of demonstrating. So that's great. If you get the opportunity to apply for a Bill Holm research grant at the Burke Museum, do that thing. Um, reach out to me, I'll write you a support letter because it is amazing how many Northwest Coast art objects they have. Um, just it'll blow your mind. You, you might cry a lot. I cried the first time that I went into the collection. How do you start? Um, it's great. Uh, then we're that same week. Actually, uh, she and I are opening a show at the Stonington Gallery called Sisters. It's original. We're doing it. We're doing it. Um, but Clinkett Sisters, we're doing a show with Stonington Gallery in Seattle. Um, it's a lot. Um, it's a lot. We're gonna finish some, we're gonna finish our baby robes sometime in November, December this year. And hopefully we're going to finish the weavers across the waters. Whoa, go back in time. That was Clarissa's robe that she collaborated and got like 60 volunteer weavers. The weavers across the waters robe lives at the Evergreen College Longhouse Studio. Sorry, that is correct. Evergreen College Longhouse Weaver Studio. So that's where Weavers Across the Waters live. We are working on the Giving Strength Robe, which is slated for the Aware Shelter here in Juneau, a healing robe for survivors of domestic and sexual violence woven in um, both Raven's Tail and Chilcat and using the colors of 
domestic and sexual violence. So in a bright teal and a, um, a deep purple. And again, we had like 54, almost 60 weavers. We have a little five by five square um, with the intent of bringing strength to survivors. So the, that energy that we put into the work, you imagine the prayers and strength of 60 plus people draped on your shoulders. So we're, we're hoping that that can be done by November at the same time. So we bring out all the baby robes and the giving strength robe and have a dedication first dance event, um, make a big to do of it. Hopefully we'll be able to hang out by then and not do it on Zoom, but we'll see. And huge thanks to Stephanie Anderson and the Weavers in Portland. Oh, I want to name all of you. There's Margaret and Joni and oh my gosh, I know I'm gonna forget you. And I'm not forgetting you. I can see your face, but there are four of you. I know, um, Margaret, Joni, Stephanie, I, Leslie, you, no. Mm. Anyway, appreciate you all. They are working on borders right now for the Giving Strength Robe. And I think they just finished them. So they're gonna send them back up. Um, but it really does take community to make these works happen and to prep all the materials. And we're grateful for community, no matter how many thousands of miles away you are. Thanks for being part of this. Wonderful, thank you so much. So if anyone's interested in learning about how they can um, respectfully and, um, you know, assist Lily and other weavers come together and gather um, in, in an environmentally conscientious way and a respectful way of nature and, um, and the earth, these materials and assist with some of this incredible work Lily is doing to support the community, um, not just weavers, but obviously you are looking to, um, to also assist people outside of the weaver circle from what it sounds like your incredible work supporting women, um, women who've been victims of domestic violence and the like. Um, it's all incredible work. And so thank you for doing that. If anyone would like to assist Lily, learn how to go about uh, helping her, how you can learn more about weaving, how you can learn more about processing materials, gathering the materials yourself firsthand, etc. cetera, um, please do go look to Lily using her Gmail email address. It's typed in the chat. And also check out her Patreon website, check out her website. And if you're in the Juneau area, visit her storefront at 221 Seward Street um, and see if you can help lend a hand and um, learn something. Sometimes the scariest part is just beginning. But as she said, there are plenty of tutorials. And Lily, I hope you'll be doing some um, hands-on classes and some teaching um, outside of um, the areas of Juno and also Seattle for, for all the folks who can't be in those two places physically. It'd be lovely to, um, to have some discussion and dialogue with you and to be able to work with you again. And I know people would like the opportunity to learn firsthand in person with you um, sometime in the next year or two. I hope that comes up. That would bring me a lot of joy. I would be happy to do that. I, I love sharing sharing and getting people excited about it and um, getting your hands dirty. Let's get our hands dirty together. We're, it's not really dirty. We're, we're just going to pull out some sticks and stuff from the mountain goat. Just don't rub your nose afterwards because you'll have hair, like big white guard hairs in your nose. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, last chance. If anyone has any question, please feel free to unmute yourself um, and let Lily know and Otherwise, I just want to remind you again, please attend the Friends of Sheldon Jackson Museum Saturday, that's next Saturday, April 2nd, silent auction. All the proceeds will go to support the Alaska Native Artist Residency Program. And all of the purchases, the value of your purchase, should you buy anything at the auction, that value will be counted towards the match, the Texans fundraiser, so you're essentially going to double your gift and walk away with whatever beautiful object or wonderful book or lovely piece of jewelry, et cetera, that you buy at the auction. It's a very good cause. 
Thank you to the Texans for supporting it. You can go to friendsofsjm.com slash match for information on how you can um, support the Friends with that fundraiser, help them carry out their mission to support the Sheldon Jackson Museum. And um, thank you, Lily, for being the last speaker in our 2022 winter series. It's been so great to have you here. Thanks again for having me. It's a pleasure. Be well, everyone. Take care.